Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Event Icons. This is a very exciting show for me because uh, today we're talking influencer marketing. It's one of the biggest marketing buzzwords of the year. And more importantly, we're going to be talking about how you can use it to grow your event. Uh, in a time when audience acquisitions, you know, extremely critical, finding the path to converting that interest to ticket sales matters. Um, so we're very lucky to have a trio of experts who are going to provide you with perspective tools and uh, how to go forward to determine if influencer marketing is right for your organization. Uh, and if it is, how to implement it. Um, so. so we should jump right on in. Should we get the show started, Alex? Let's do it. Let's, yeah. do it. Let's drop that intro. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Dot com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. So, we got, like Alex said, we have an awesome episode lined up today, uh, which I'm also really excited for. But, you know, I think I'm always excited for every episode, if you haven't ever realized. <laughs> I'm excited about it. I was excited about videos this morning as well. Um, but today we're talking about influencer marketing. What is it? And some of you might be considering, what the heck is it? It's okay. We'll jump into that real quick. But we do want to introduce our guests. And I want to introduce someone that I've known for a very, very long period of time and actually is from outside the events industry. Melissa Brandle, who's uh, below me, side me, something like that. Melissa's with August United. And Melissa and I go way back. I actually spoke in a class a long time ago about inbound marketing. And she came up and she was probably the smartest ASU student I think I've ever met in the marketing space. Uh, lo and behold, she works for one of the best, the best influencer marketing companies, I would say, when it comes to it. So we had to have her on the show. She literally deals with influencers and on the client side. So she knows how to manage them, how to do it the right way. So we had to have her on the show. So Melissa, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a chance for you to introduce uh, a little bit more about yourself in just a minute. But uh, before we do, um, a man who needs uh, no introduction. Nick Borelli in the house is also going to be talking about influencer marketing. We had you on the show for the trends episode in December of last year. Um, and we actually had talked about influencer marketing and said, this is so big. We have to have our own episode. Um, so I, I will link down below. If you haven't seen that episode, get the intro from Nick on what it's all about. Also, we'll link to his previous episodes. He's been on the show as a guest exclusively before, so you can hear his whole life story. But this man is not only an expert on influencer marketing, but he's definitely an influencer in the events industry. So it'll be awesome to see both perspectives as well. So um, we're so happy I'm to just have looking you. At your, just looking at your pops, trying to figure out which ones I like the best. Uh, is that, <laughs> it looks like a Bane. Is that Bane? Like a classic, like like animated series Bane? Um, right there in the middle. Like, no, like down by Plastic Man and like uh, one of the Wonder oh, Twins. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a classic. Yeah, it's the classic uh, like uh, Batman. The That's nice. Thanks, man. That's very nice. I think that's the first time someone's called out a specific pop on my uh, my show. I mean, I probably can name them all. I like the White Lantern Flash is really nice too. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this isn't about comics, but we should. If, if should I if be. I can talk about something, if I'd say if I can talk about something in an episode that makes another episode happen, let's do one on like comic books or comic cons or something. We can tangentially do this. There you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, Nick, Nick, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're excited to have you again here as well. Um, Good to be here. And, you know, there's, there's also someone really important on the show as well. And when it comes to influencer marketing the event space, probably the best person to talk about this is Rachel Steven. Rachel is actually the founder of Snowball. And if you haven't heard Snowball, Snowball actually is an influencer, can I call it like system? Is, it, is that fair, fair to call a system? 
system platform platform whatever. that platform's a little bit more that sounds a little, a little bit more sophisticated so it's a platform <laughs> for you to basically utilize influencers to drive ticket sales. Um, and she literally, when we talked, she has so many tactical advices for how to actually use influencers to drive butts and seats um, that we had to have her on the show. Uh, and we're really, really excited to have you here today, Rachel. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Awesome. All right, Alex, why don't you kick it off with, uh, with our, our, our classic first question that we ask everybody. Classic first question. So Nick has already answered this many, many times. So we're going to let the ladies go first. Um, the question we like to ask all of our guests is, what got you into the events industry? And if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? So let's hmm. start with Rachel this time. Nice. Start with me. Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how did I start in it? Uh, I don't know. My, my background was in advertising and marketing and um, I was in agencies like uh, more for consumers and the uh, products for a few years. And then by fluke, I guess uh, I landed this job at this uh, company that does um, event directories, believe it or not. And it was more like working with the events and the conferences and I got a peek into all that um, and I got the bug from there. I started initially in corporate events, special events and all that. And then I found out the conference uh, field and I said, hmm, this is really interesting because I like the fact of working on campaigns that kind of span more than a year sometimes uh, and see it build and strategize and, and work that way. So I stuck to that niche and it's been 17 years now. Wow. That's great. Now, oh, if I didn't, if, not, if, if I wasn't in that industry, that's the question. I, I have yeah, made there. a couple of different things. I could have been interior designer, which I love interior design, anything architecture, or a, an antique hunter, Ooh. or an investigator. <laughs> you have I three options. I have my options going. I think that's the first time we've heard any of those three <laughs> options. And we've had a lot of episodes. So that impressive that you not only came up with one but three <laughs> brand new <laughs> i'm saving some of them for my retirement <laughs> awesome. well melissa you're not quite in the events industry so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into marketing why that appealed to you and if you weren't doing that what would you be doing yeah definitely so i studied marketing at asu and one of my professors actually um, runs a marketing agency and so through him I was able to get an internship during the school year and then um, there was a really neat opportunity after I graduated to stay on board. They were actually um, just launching their influencer marketing agency and I had always been interested and fascinated by YouTube and Instagram. Uh, I definitely grew up in that era. And so I remember in middle school, I would watch YouTubers religiously after I came home from school and was just so is intrigued by them and loved what they were doing. And so uh, when the opportunity came up after I graduated to work for this agency, um, August United, I took it and I've been here ever since. I've been working here for just over two years now and love it. And if I wasn't doing influencer marketing, I would either be a full-time videographer, I love making videos and editing videos, all that fun stuff. Um, I can see people motioning this, but uh, the other thing is I would be a professional fire spinner. <laughs> so I've been twirling. It's crazy good, but like, it's, it's wow. scary. I don't know how she does it. Have you, have you had that one before, Alex? Is that a new one? I think that's a new one, too. That's probably <laughs> We're icons. We're just getting like a sound effect. You should have started I, I, the episode with that. Very few episodes, I've never heard fire. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I've been, so I've been twirling batons for my whole life. I was a competitive baton twirler growing up, and then after I graduated, I needed a hobby to pick up, and so I was like, why not just add fire to the ends of it? So <laughs> I, I do a couple of shows every, every so often, but yeah, if I wasn't working a, a full-time marketing job, maybe I would be doing that full-time and, and twirling in like Vegas or something. Wow. That's... Have you worked with pyro guys before, Will? Uh, I haven't. I actually stay away from pyro just because I think my insurance company would not. I, like I, I have in, in like an event entertainment. And I can tell you that like generally speaking, they're a type and like <laughs> don't like I, I like the fact that Melissa doesn't really fit the type 
for like pyro, pyro people I've met. Like that, that's, uh, it's, it's cool when you come out of, you know, not obvious. Generally you meet a pyro guy, you're like, let me guess. I, I haven't heard a thing you said yet, but you're into pyrotechnics. And <laughs> Hmm. He's got like burn marks around his fingertips, everything like that. <laughs> Little twitchy, always like leather on leather, all black, tons of patches and pins, uh, long no, hair. No eyelashes? Uh, no, <laughs> not, not that much. Black fingernail. You got, you got the one black fingernail. Yeah, it's a type. So for those who may be new to event icons, Nick has been on uh, episode uh, 40, 57, where it was, we called him the Chuck you Norris him up? events. And uh, episode 92 was the last time you were on the show. So why don't you tell us what you've been up to since then? I mean, uh, working, uh, I don't know, nothing crazy. I, I, I've had the opportunity to be in, I think, uh, since December, about 16 different cities uh, speaking. Uh, so I've done a lot, a lot of that. I'm on a, uh, an unprecedented amount of uh, time off uh, uh, sabbatical. Uh, for two months, probably it's been four years since that's been the case, uh, because uh, my wife and I are due any time between today, hopefully I don't have to leave this, uh, and maybe and 10 days from now. So uh, I'm sticking around Ooh. for a while. But very exciting. I'm actually, very exciting. You. Yeah, very exciting. You. you know, that could be our first, first too. Our first event icons, baby. <laughs> first event icons, baby. First oh. event icons. The show must go on, right? So, uh, you know, if you guys want to hear everything that comes with that, that's, that's up to you. It's a different kind of an event. Uh, but, uh, no, I've actually been speaking quite a bit about uh, influencer marketing for live events. And actually, I would say two cities ago, I was in uh, Ottawa, and that was the topic of my, my keynote presentation was on uh, utilizing influencers as a, a sort of uh, a stakeholder that you weren't aware of in your event um, that is out there uh, that as an investment in uh, their attention uh, that you can then turn around if you do it in a way that is holistic. And I guess I'll probably get into what that means as we progress, but. Awesome. That is awesome. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited to jump in. Let's start getting into the tacticalness of it all. I love making up words. Um, and I want to, for people who don't know what influencer marketing is, to define it. And it's funny, we scheduled this episode in December. And even the last five months, things have shifted so much about what is going on with influencer marketing. So let's kick it off. Melissa, if you want to start really briefly, kind of talk a little bit about what do you define as influencer marketing? And then we'll go around and everyone can kind of compile this mega definition of what influencer marketing is. Sure. So to start off, um, I'll define what an influencer is. An influencer is basically someone on online, on social, who has an engaged following. Um, that's basically what it is. And influencer marketing is a strategy for brands who want to be more well-known, who want to be more impressive. They unite with the social influencers to create awesome content, promote a certain product, service, or offering in a way that's very unique, in a way that's very relatable, and in a way that kind of breaks the norm of how a brand typically talks about their story. I like it. I like it. I like the, how it covers it. It covers everything. Rachel, would you have anything that you would add on to, to what you define as an influencer or as influencer marketing? Oh, I think I would second what uh, Melissa was saying, uh, but uh, for the event specifically uh, industry, um, you know, with the influencer marketing could be seen as so many different uh, types of influencers. So you have your big micro influencers that people think that these are the ones that we need to get to get uh, butts in seats. Uh, the big high ticketed people, the speakers or celebrities, but uh, there's the micro micro influencers, which where I, my heart lies. And uh, I, I like to work with those people because anybody has the chance to influence somebody into making sort, sort of a decision to attend an event. So anyone is an influencer in my opinion anyways. Uh, so it doesn't matter how many influencers you have, uh, followers you have, it's more who do you know and just like affecting that small little circle around you to kind of talk about a certain event and be the channel that the event planner can work with you to get that word out to that community. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Okay. Nick, would you agree? Do you think anyone can be an influencer? Yes. Uh, it, it's, all, it's all a matter of scale, you know, as far as your goals. 
uh, I, I'm really, all, I'm always trying on, on, on this to be able to uh, get into uh, Alex's tweets. So I'll try to be as concise as possible. Uh, <laughs> I believe uh, influence, uh, an influencer is someone with sufficient uh, reach, resonance, and relevance. That's it. Uh, and it can scale in any direction. Um, but again, that doesn't fit in the tweet. Uh, but ultimately, it's, uh, it's just about credibility. You know, does this, is this person credible? Uh, and if you want to use them in, in part of an influencer marketing strategy, what's required uh, uh, first and foremost is uh, an overlap between mission and values between the influencer and the brand. If you guys are on the same page, you're working towards the same thing, you should be together. I love it. But, but for Alex... Cheating? Uh, before, before, yeah, before Alex asks the next question, for those who don't know, we live tweet this entire show. So if you follow us on Twitter at hello endless, there's live tweets going out right now with concise things like what Nick just said, um, that get posted. And then we also, uh, rehash them into Instagram posts on our Instagram, which is at the same handle as well. So, um, for anyone who's confused what that reference was to that, there is, I mean, Alex live- is lightning fast with them too. So, uh, <laughs> it likely, if you look up that hashtag, you're going to find gems all day. All day on, on camera though. Yep. Yeah, yep. I mean, it, just go to hashtag and icon. Search finger blurs. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Alex, go ahead. Sorry, I just had. I had to so, so that's interesting though. I think I think a lot of people when they hear influencer marketing, they automatically think of the Kims and the Kanyes of the world, and exactly. they kind of think that it's it's beyond their capabilities. Um, so to hear the term micro influencers and that anyone can be an influencer is really fascinating and i think that's something that we'd like to talk more about and dive into a bit um you know can any size or type of event benefit from influencer market marketing is it for a show that's 100 people or just for shows that are 2000 I think any yes. event can benefit from it. I mean, the number one challenge usually is, you hear it, is that they want to get more people in the room. They want to grow the event. Uh, so if it's an, in hundred or thousands of people, it's the same thing is, you know, working with those specific groups in order to get word out to other people. So if I talk to you about a certain event and I say, hey, I'm going to that one, and I just, you got inf- to influence one. So if a hundred people influenced each one, you got double the attendance right there. You know, take a percentage it's of that. It's low hanging fruit, right? Like it's the it, lowest hanging fruit. It is, and that's that's the key. Also, is working with the ones who are already part of the event. So it's not like getting somebody from outside of the industry that has a big following. It's somebody who is already involved in the event, who experienced it because you know they they sampled the product in a way, <laughs> if they've been to that event. So they already know what they're talking about. In the presentations that I do on influencer marketing, uh, the examples that I often use are two that are both Alex, uh, which you probably have seen the, your, your picture up on slides on, on, uh, on screens or whatever. Uh, one is inbound, uh, recognizing Alex as a, a person in the midst of their event who was prolific and also uh, influential in what, they were sh- what he was sharing. Uh, and another was uh, with, MPI recognizing the fact that he was there and sharing uh, and they were at different levels as far as you know compensation or even recognizing but but the difference will I mean the, the thing that they both share is that they took the time to listen to what was being said online and uh, and reward someone who was doing their work for them it's a really like it's the lowest hanging fruit it's the cheapest thing you can do to uh, Martial forces that are probably already there. Yeah. Melissa, at what point does this like get start to blur the lines of like referral based marketing as well? Is it, you know, like what, what are your kind of thoughts as far as like, well, you know, like the size audience where you see benefits? I mean, because you're dealing with clients who are gigantic mega brands, but you also deal with like local companies as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, really, what we do at our agency in the event space, because we do. We do both digital campaigns, but we are also starting to bridge the gap between digital and in person. So I think this conversation is is really interesting. We've we've can you hosted, define digital versus in person? What that means? Yeah, so digital campaigns are campaigns that we run on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, and then in person campaigns are. Um, 
hosted influencer events. And so we, we bring influencers together for uh, maybe the launch of a particular product or the launch of a restaurant and bring them all together um, for an exciting time where they create content, have, and then post that on their social uh, where they have a certain call to action. So we're starting to, to do that more often with our clients. Um, and, you know, there is a, a difference in, in terms when it comes to if we want influencers to be focusing on creating content or driving traffic to a certain site to, um, to drive those refer referrals. Um, so it can, it can do both. Mm. Uh, I am curious to know um, how these different influencer campaigns can kind of work. Can you all share an example of what you think is like a successful influencer campaign or one that you liked a lot or an example of how people can utilize this today? Because uh, some people might be thinking to themselves like, I don't, I, I don't know how to exactly do this or where do I even start? Um, can you provide some like inspiration for what you've seen? Nick, do you want to kick it off? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, example is, is that the, the Cleveland Zoo, I'm friends with people that produce the events there. Uh, they have a really awesome event each year that's kind of like a gala fundraiser. Uh, and they, they look across uh, the spectrum of the types of people within their city who are traditional philanthropic base and untraditional philanthropic base. And then they try to find people that those, uh, those groups would follow. Um, in an instance that I can think of off the top of my head, there's a, a fairly prolific uh, a lifestyle uh, yoga and health and wellness uh, uh, celebrity, micro celebrity within Cleveland, Ohio, uh, that has a lot of resonance because it's very Cleveland centric. Uh, and all they do is they give her tickets. Uh, they give her and her family some tickets and they give her five extra ones to give out as rewards uh, to, to do for gamification on their social media. And like the hard cost is anyone that's produced events for extra tickets is very minimal, right? So we're not talking, and we, we eventually we can talk about large contract-based uh, influencer marketing, uh, you know, uh, compensation. But at the base level for events, you could probably just get somebody a free ticket and they'll be excited about that. And if you give them a couple extra, they can start building anticipation because there's a built-in, uh, you know, methodology there to give away similar to what radio shows do. Okay. What about you, Rachel? Do you have any examples of events that have successfully done this or other ways in which they could do influencer marketing? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, in my case, what I can share is the ones, like the campaigns that I've seen and we worked on, the, the influencers are not uh, paid. Uh, they, they are doing it for free because they are part of the event in a way. So um, there's two types. So when we do it through Snowball is activating them a little bit at large for so anybody who's part of the event gets to uh, spread the word that way. But there's also another approach is working directly with uh, speakers or committee members into generating content of value that kind of samples a little bit the conference prior to the events. So our, our interest is like way before the event. So to get people to the event, uh, you know, it's a cycle. So uh, working with them and creating that content to so facilitate because not all the time they are able to create that content on their own, but they have that wealth of expertise that they have in a specific industry. It could be geology, could be engineering, mining, whatever. So it's, it's important to help them get that out of their head and create that content and then repurpose that content in different ways to drive traffic back to your, to your conference. So there's like different levels, different types that we do and different also outcomes that we look for. Uh, it's not always driving sales. Uh, we also get them in to help build the program. So there's, there's different ways that you could use influencer campaign in order to build up what you want to build for the conference way before. Excellent. So oh, real quick, can I, I want, if Melissa can share one more example, maybe of something non-event related so people can have an idea of how, how you view, how, your clients have utilized influencer marketing. Yeah, well, Rachel, I think you bring up a great point about having influencers be co-creators of the event. Um, that's where we have seen our biggest success with events is when they're actively a part of it. It's more than just inviting them to it and hoping that they'll you know, take photos while they're there and post it. It's getting them integrated into the core of what the event is all about. Um, we actually just ran an event um, a couple of weeks ago in Vegas where we worked with a local grocery store um, to launch their uh, new meal kits. And um, we invited local influencers to come down to the store and we had a, a huge setup with different 
um, ovens and stoves and whatnot, cutting boards. And they actually, we did a live video. They prepared the meals um, together as a, as a group. I believe there were quite a few influencers there and they promoted this ahead of time on their social, invited their audience to come down and watch. And then um, from there, they were able to, to gather a ton of great content and then post that to their own social. And, and it was such a great fit because you know, this grocery store, they, because they're locals, they normally shop there anyway. So there's that authenticity factor that made us such a great partnership that they were excited to be a part of. Um, and then from there, they then posted uh, various forms of content, Instagram posts, Instagram stories, and that just continued the conversation after the event happened. They were able to talk more about the grocery store and more about the meal kits. Yeah, that's exactly what you're, what you're saying. Is like the they already know the uh, the product, they've already consumed it, so it comes more authentic for people when they talk about that event, or uh, not event, the uh, the actual store. So that's key, mm -hmm. authenticity. Yeah. So, Alex, you had a question, I think. Yeah, I do, and I'm curious since you three are experts on this. Um, you know what I do is I work with associations and corporations on their social media strategies, and one thing that I've been doing with them. And I'm curious if you would consider this influencer marketing. I've been having, you know, Facebook, the first thing you, that happens when you get on in the morning is it tells you your memories. Mm -hmm. so what I've been doing my, having my clients do is have a contest around the time period of their registration deadlines. Um, they tend to have their registration deadline within a few weeks of each other every year. Um, so what I've been having them do is run a contest where people post their favorite memory with a photo of past events. So that way, the following year, that memory comes up and essentially they're influencing themselves with their favorite memory of the event. Love it. Like it is. <laughs> It's like the dream within a dream. The influencer within the influencer. Exactly. <laughs> so, it's it's the never ending story. It's going to come up. <laughs> <a bit. laughs> but you know what you're saying is, you know, with you knowing the event, you're the best influencer to influence other people. Yes. Well, pretty cool. That's yeah, a micro. Like that. That's a great idea. A Love it. Right. They're, 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 uh, the circle of influences themselves. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> it's it's 100% uh, likely to succeed, and uh, yet it's a very small scope. It's cool. It's exactly. cool. I like it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe it is right. Uh, I, like I don't I don't get so caught up in defining this stuff. I mean, if it works, it, it is what it is. It, it borrows it borrows from you know I, I suppose the uh, idea of uh, uh, not even like the the only part I can see it, it's it's not about like. It's not about resonance. Oh, it's about resonance. I guess it's not, it's not about amplification. It's simply about the likelihood of you listening to yourself is pretty high. I don't know. It's a really interesting idea. I, I don't know how you would define that, but, but like, pretty you, cool. you raise a good point though, Nick, is that, you know, you don't know if it works and stuff. I mean, all this, you don't know if it works from one industry to another, from a different group to another. And it's all about trying. And that's the key is trying and see what figures what, you know, what works and keep an eye on it, measure it, and then try to something else if it doesn't. I mean, we've seen campaigns in, in the industry where it's like completely dead. You provide them everything and they're still not doing anything with it. And other ones, they're just like right on it and it's like crazy, it's on fire. So it's, it's, a, it's still, a, you have to keep trying and figuring out which one works. So, so let's talk about, you know, beyond influencing yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do we, like, like, let's go for how two. How do we identify who the influencers are for our events you know what are the best tips that um event organizers can use to identify these people well if you start at the event itself like you said you're a perfect example you know you're listening to who are the, the loudest voices uh, basically on social and sharing all these uh, memories and experiences and moments at at the event and you can approach them if you're starting at the event if you're starting way before then it's also about, you know, listening and depending who you want to target really and who is the group that you want to use that influencer to reach that specific audience or that circle that they have with them. And the other point that I bring always is that start at home. They're, 
your speakers, your exhibitors, your attendees, board your members, board members I mean, your committees, you know, you build a technical program, you have a lot of people who are on board with that. They know the industry and each one of them has their own expertise and they have their community around them, around that expertise. Why not start there? That's what I would say. I mean, there's lots of the software that will also identify them for you. Uh, there's many of them basically but you know best and it's, uh, it's a matter of looking in your own backyard yeah yeah i would definitely agree with that it, it really can start with finding out who who's a raging fan of you already who's already following you on social who's already uh talking about about the events and um and then from there i guess finding the people who um are already talking about these kinds of things and in our agency, we use a number of tools um, to, to identify influencers based on audience size that we're trying to go for, engagement rates, um, different keywords that we're able to type in and filter out influencers. So there's a number of online tools to find folks who, who would already connect with something like this. What sort of tools would you recommend? Um, yeah, so there are a number of them. Um, a couple, Grin um, is, a, is a good one that we're uh, testing out right now. Um, what's there's it, what's a couple, Grin. G-R-I-N? Grin. Yes, like a Grin. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's really cool because it's it does filter out by platform, um, audience size, engagement rate. Engagement rate is something that we really look for in an influencer and if if, I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but it's much more than just about audience size. It's also about um, how is their community engaging with them and with their content. Um, and then, like I mentioned, uh, different keywords. And so if, for a campaign that we're running, if we're looking for people who talk about um, mom products, then we can filter it out by um, mom, mother, um, family, kids, um, different keywords. There's a tool uh, called BuzzSumo also. Yeah, that's what I mean. And the uh, tracker. And tracker is like, it's missing the E, right? T R A C T R. It's a double A T R A A C K R C K E R, I think. I'm, I'm missing the E, I think. Yeah, it's missing the E too. C K R. And mention also. Mention.com. Well, mention's good. Yeah, it's inexpensive. Uh, before I even worry about trying to find who my uh, influencers are, I spend. Uh, a disproportionate amount of my time trying to build uh, attendee personas or in the cases of uh, suppliers, uh, buyer personas, because I'm looking for uh, arranging the influencers and aligning the influencers up with um, a diverse cross section of people who would, would want to buy from me. Uh, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket and I want to be able to have different authentic messages uh, about what I'm trying to sell uh, resonate differently. So uh, as opposed to, you know, for people in that, like the mom blogger space, right? If I looked at my event or service that I was trying to sell, um, I would focus on trying the most disparate groups of people first uh, that have the least amount of Venn diagram uh, overlap and uh, finding someone who represents them uh, through, you know, social listening, uh, research, and simply uh, doing some polling along the lines of, um, you know, asking trusted partners. And uh, if I have stakeholders in the event, those are the first people I ask because they ultimately, who they want to have come is what matters. So I, I start there and then before I get to software or, you know, social media. Uh, and then when I start looking at, at, at the, like the social listening, as much as I'm looking for all the things that matter for uh, influence as far as being able to get your message out there, I'm looking for people who um, have passionate credibility that also their voice isn't so antithetical to the voice of the brand. Like it has to be a good match. And there's a lot of loud macro examples of uh, uh, larger industries like YouTube and Disney who have had bad partnerships because of, um, you know, empowering uh, sociopaths uh, who, you know, uh, attract the, the the age eight to twelve when you're like at your height of your sociopathness, you know. Uh, there's a lot of those <laughs> types of people out there on YouTube, uh, as there's some examples in the news lately to support. Um, but uh, you really have to know these people and, and know that the way that they would behave before you can you know give them the keys to you know a brand alignment. That's so, why. I 
that's why I think that was, if you work with the ones already part of your event and they've experienced it, then they already know the event one. And if you, if you can bury it a little bit to when you do advertising on Facebook and you look at, build the campaign on the lookalike type of approach while well, working with the existing group of people for your event and having them tap into their network you know the chances of a geologist having friends who are also geologists are pretty high so yeah. you're, you're tapping into that so that's i think the key that you know the shortcut i guess to uh to getting to the right uh, target group yeah and i also i think it's it's so important to also figure out what your what your goals are is, is your goal to reach the largest amount of people as possible is your goal clicks is it um ticket uh, ticket signups? Is it content creation? And then from there, then you're able to determine what kinds of influencers are going to be the best to help you reach those goals. Okay. So now that, you know, we've identified who these people are, what's next? What is the ask? How do you approach these people? Yeah. So, for us, when, when we have an influencer in mind that we want to work with, uh, we typically start with just a, a simple email outreach and let them know high level what the event is, what the campaign is, um, give them an overview of, of just all that's going on. And then um, typically we like to hop on a phone call with them to share more details with them. And it's definitely a collaborative process. And so we, we never come to an influencer and say, you know, this is exactly what we what we want you to do X, Y, and Z. Um, not the way that influencer marketing really works. Um, influencers they know their audience like the back of their hand, and so it's really important to be collaborative with them and um, and you know first off to share the goals that we are trying to accomplish, and then have a conversation with them about how they think their audience would resonate with a message like that, how they think that um, the they could create content that would achieve the goal in the most effective way. Um, and then from there, we typically have a conversation around uh, compensation, whether it's monetary or some other form of compensation. All right, I can say as someone who's been on the other side of that, if that's an interesting perspective, um, like a very specific example, uh, with uh, Eventbrite. So exactly what you said, they came to me and said, hey, I think we're, you know, simpatico. We, we seem to have a lot of the same uh, goals. Um, would you be interested in some sort of collaboration in the form of you making your audience aware of content that we have? Now, I'm in the, you know, the B2B space for live events and in the content business and about empowering and educating people. So from a standpoint of, it's a brand that I read and pay attention and have done work for before. Uh, I, I don't see them doing harm in the space. And all I'm doing is empowering, you know, people with, you know, free content that obviously they're going to get the emails for the rest of their lives, but that's, that's the payment, you know, process in the 21st century. Um, I, I could do no harm. It was on mission and, uh, it, and they had it in a way that was, they didn't dictate how it had to be done. They simply said, we like what you do do some of that aimed our way and it was really pretty effortless you know truly and i think that when when it's right it is it feels that way uh, maybe you can agree or not but I, there's probably some people that don't quite get the process or and maybe are confused by the transactional relationship but um i, I don't know like i've i found that it was and, and even in conferences that have asked me to attend and uh talk about the conference and things like that and gave me a position and helped me uh, uh impact the design of the event like at I was part of the team you know and that was uh, a feeling that made it pretty easy to do interesting Rachel what about you I know you kind of have a unique ex uh, perspective because of what snowball does and the capabilities so yeah curious that works well th there's two things like what, what we do under snowball I, I don't know if I didn't mention that the company, the main company is Sense of Event Marketing. That's my company that I started 17 years ago. And that's, uh, you know, based on experience working with the, 
associations and conferences to on their event marketing campaign we found influencer marketing was key in, in getting the word out and that's why we opened up we started we launched snowball back in august so uh so there's two different approaches to the influencer marketing the way we do it through snowball is more at large so it's activating pretty much everyone who's involved at the event, uh, working with the client to find out, you know, which group specifically. So exhibitors, sponsors, speakers. So that we provide them with content already pre-done for them in a way, because the industries that we work with, they're not all comfortable creating their own content. So in some ways they are so thankful and we get emails back saying, thank you for making it easy. All they have to do is just like take it and run with it. The ones who are comfortable with it, they switch up and then create their own stuff with it, which is great. The other side of it too is a little bit going a little bit more in depth with the influencer that we work with. We work with the speakers directly and some of them are like the rock stars of those specific interviews. So for that, uh, you know, we get introduced. Usually the best way to get to them is introduced by the conference chair. So the introduction is sent by email to them asking them to be part of in, into the event marketing campaign. And then we, we have that conversation with them. We have the call. We have a video interview with them. Uh, turn it into a blog or a podcast or, you know, repurpose all the different, uh, that expertise that we pull from them through the interview and then use that to kind of create uh, a campaign with it. Awesome. Well, we only have a little bit of time left, so we got a flurry of questions to get through and answer. Um, so people are wanting to know a little bit more about the transparency and participants seeing what's going on. So that authenticity, right? And, um, you know, for example, if you are doing some sort of influencer marketing, I see it all the time with YouTubers. They always have to put like hashtag ad at the end of everything. What are your recommendations for best practices when it comes to transparency and how do you keep it authentic? Yes, yeah, the, the FTC is, um, that's a big deal in the influencer marketing world. Um, whenever there's any sort of compensation involved, it's required for the influencer to disclose that. And typically what that looks like is um, it could be hashtag ad, it could be hashtag brand partner. Um, and that has to be very visible in the post. So in the case of an Instagram post, um, it needs to be uh, above the fold of the Instagram caption and in a YouTube video. It needs to be mentioned in the video as well as in the description. So it has to be very clear to the audience that the, the content is, is compensated. Yeah. And it, what I've been doing when I, when I am at uh, marketing conferences is I'm finding uh, agencies that specialize this and listening to what they're saying, mostly uh, in the arena of legalities, because I find that uh, once you understand the mechanics, it's just, it's one more tool in your tool belt and you can use it in ways I've never heard each time, like influencing yourself, right? That's a new one. Uh, so it's the legalities that I find that that's the area where you should probably work with an agency that specializes in that because that's no joke and it is black and white. The creativity, you know, you, you may be able to take it on yourself. Uh, I, I do like even, even later, I've recently seen that the FTC, uh, guidelines for endorsements, uh, are, are really pushing people to have the, the hashtag ad stuff at the at the very beginning uh, as opposed to the end and and look there the, the the enforcement of these depends on how much how risk averse you are or what have you I mean I'm never going to be someone that's going to get on mic and tell people to do anything that's risky but uh, I will say that like they as as this gains heat in our industry as will the uh, uh, ability for the government to pay more attention to this but but ultimately it doesn't matter. Like it, it, you should absolutely do this and it's not going to hurt you. You should be as transparent, a hunt, more transparent than you need to be legally uh, because it's good for everyone. And, and all studies have shown specifically in millennials and Gen Z that they have zero problem uh, consuming content that comes from someone who is being compensated from it because they assume that's happening. So the fear of it not being it's seen as something that is uh, happening in a way that um, is above board for most generations is simply not a fear that's real. Uh, so I think that paying attention to that will make it so you, you don't want to try to pull a fast one on anybody. And the reality is, is that you can't really trick all the people all the time anyway. So just be 100% transparent 
and realize that your credibility is hard to get, uh, really, really hard to build and very, very easy to lose. Yeah, and something else that's really important for brands to realize is that um, that compliance is, is on the brand. So if an influencer does not disclose, it's the brand or whoever, the agency, whoever contracted the influencer, they'll get the, they'll get the fault. Um, so it's really important to make sure that who you're partnering with are abiding by those uh, principles. That is really important and fascinating. I did not know that. Um, there's a few people we want to shout out. We have people watching, you know, on Zoom and Facebook. Uh, you know, thank you to Peggy and Thomas and Tanya. Uh, Melinda said, uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Organizing events and getting people there can be a huge challenge. Your insight is priceless. So right now, you three are influencing people. <laughs> which is great. Um, that's why we do this show. We um, were not paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no disclosure necessary. <laughs> well, it is called trust-based marketing in a way. So once you break that trust, then you know, it defeats the whole purpose. It's going to backfire. I think all marketing and all sales is really, it's just a, it's just a conversation about trust. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if you want to gain ground faster, uh, then building trust along the time parameters that you would have otherwise, you can borrow the trust earned by other people and apply that trust uh, to what you're doing. So it's just it's it's a kind of an an, an all the uh, always going on balance between trust and time, and you can either stay the course and you know just produce a great product and grow one percent every year. Or you can get more creative, uh, find an agency or a consultant or get creative yourself and uh, find a path that takes other people's trust that has already been earned. Like an example with Snowball is it, it empowers people that have already earned trust. I mean, they, they probably would do these things for you anyway. It's just their lives are busy. It's difficult. It's tough to do. But if you just empower them, all of a sudden you find that the lowest hanging fruit to grow your event has always been there. They just didn't have the tools. No, we've seen it. One client uh, in 24 hours of launching the campaign, they got 10% increase in the registration. It's great. Awesome. It's, I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we don't have a lot of time. So we got one more question from the audience that we want to answer. They want to know how much should you be budgeting for this sort of stuff? You know, what does this cost? What does this even look like? Um, you know, Nick, you mentioned earlier, Tickets technically could be just the cost of whatever that is to do the ticket. But um, obviously there's some compensation that happens as well sometimes. Um, Melissa, what, what do you usually see? What are common ways of compensating? Yeah, so... Um, and how much do you budget to do this? I <laughs> yeah, so it, it really all depends on the brand and, and their goals for the campaign um, and what kind of content they're wanting to generate. Um, there are different kinds of compensation, uh, monetary compensation. Um, we oftentimes provide comp through the form of gift cards or through product. Um, we even provide compensation in the form of exclusive experiences. And that can be the most interesting because that mm -hmm. kind of compensation, you can't get from any other brand or from any other partnership. So, those, that's, cool. that's really the route that we like going the most is some sort of exclusive experience or early access, look into something where they feel like that they are a part of the brand. That kind of goes back to what we were saying about the whole idea of co-creation where you're really involving the influencer in, in the brand and in the process. Um, for monetary compensation, um, of course, it, uh, it does depend on the, the platform they're activating influencers on, but... Um, we typically see that about 1% um, of their following is what the standard is right now for an Instagram post. And so if someone has a following of 100,000 uh, people, we can see that a normal rate might be around $1,000 for an Instagram post. Um, but again, take that with a grain of salt because it really does depend on the creator. It depends what uh, what kinds of costs the creator has to endure, um, as well as the type of content, of how involving the content is that you're asking for of them. Um, but just to kind of give like a good starting point, um, that's that's what we find. And, and negotiation um, is, is a really big part of, of what we do. I mean, the influencer marketing world is still so new. There aren't really 
any set of rules yet. And so um, as long as you're excited about what you're presenting to an influencer and you are able to get the influencer excited about it, then um, just find what works best for the both of you. Awesome. Each time I've, each time I've been engaged in it, I've, I've also done negotiation uh, on the, you know, speaking as guests as the maybe potentially lone person on the other side. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe not, but, uh, the, I've negotiated every time and it's been just a conversation. Again, it's not, it, I look at it very much like if someone used to buy a lot of magazine ads, like I used to buy a lot of magazine ads, a lot of print and kerning and bleed was a big part of my life. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, the, when, how much does a magazine ad cost? I mean, depends on the resonance. It, it depends on the circulation. It depends on, so it's the same, same idea. I think people are looking for like a magic bullet as far as how much influencer uh, marketing costs. The reality is, is that it, it, it is really just measured in their success rate and their ability to convert uh, and uh, against impressions. So similar to what you would invest in. Uh, on click-through rates or, or magazine ads or whatever, whatever you, you spend your marketing, it's, it's part of your, it's another marketing channel that you should test and measure the same way you do everything else. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, it is very fluid. And there have been times where we have invested more in an, in an influencer than we normally would because we know that they'll do a phenomenal job. We know that they'll get um, the amount of, of, for example, clicks that we want them to drive. We know that they can perform really well. And there are other times where um, we have to really look at them holistically at their engagement rates, at the, their quality of content, and really make the, the decision, you know, is this a smart spend of our dollars? Ooh, do you like go it. in at, at first, Melissa, do you go in with a, like a, a little bit of a test time period to determine maybe like a sample of how effective they are and then renegotiate afterwards? Because I've done and experienced that and it was very good for both of us, I thought. Yeah, we have. We have. Yeah, there have been sub brands where we had the opportunity to create longer term partnerships. And so in those cases, we do like to test out an influencer with uh, a post in an Instagram story and see how it performs. Um, cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that, that would be my advice for people is to not necessarily have to dive in the deep end at first and give a, you know, a period of time. So both, especially if it's new to both parties to be able to, you know, find a, a comfort zone and then determine how much more you want to invest there. Exactly. And it goes two ways too, because for the influencer, you know, it's, it's a risk for them as well because they're putting their image out on the line when they're promoting a brand. And if, if totally. uh, their audience doesn't resonate well with what the influencer is promoting, then the influencer has to learn from that. But if they find that their audience really loves what they're talking about, then um, there have been times where we've had an influencer come back to us and want to work with us more because they say that you know, it, it performs so well. So it goes both ways. Yeah, awesome. that's cool. In our case, we don't pay them. <laughs> uh, because we just well, empower them. <laughs> we empower them. And the idea behind it is Snowball specifically is that because they're promoting themselves in addition to promoting the conference. So it's not just promoting your conference. So that's, the, the, that's the difference there. But they, they, they have been cases where, you know, there's some incentives thrown out, uh, you know, just like uh, to, to kind of incentivize a little bit that whole thing. And, you know, typical, for example, for exhibitors, they might give them the opportunity to pick their, uh, the priority uh, selecting their booth space for next year's, for example or a speaker might get an upgrade in their hotel room or something, you know? So it's not always monetary, but, you know, and so not always they do it. So it's most of the time I would say it's, there's no, there's no do you, perks. Do you gamify it? It was done, yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, see that, I can see that being a lot yeah. of fun. There's a campaign right now running and they have a leaderboard for all the exhibitors to see who's getting uh, the, the most people in and they get something in return. Yeah. I, I love behavior modification. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. And it, it's fun because every case is different. So we get to experiment and get ideas and, and, you know, suggest and brainstorm with the clients and how to go about it. So that's, uh, it's always fun. That's cool. That's cool. 
Speaking of behavior modification, um, we have to wrap up today's show. Um, there's so much good content. I feel like we could go on forever for sure, but we do have to come to an end. So we want to start with our last two questions we do for every episode, starting with what is your one tip that you have for event planners, whether it's related to influencer marketing, marketing in general, or just you have a tip that you want to drop for event planners. Um, Melissa, go ahead and kick it off with your one tip that you have for event planners. Sure. So my one tip, um, well, I'll give two because I already kind of talked about one of them, but my biggest tip would be to um, pick a goal or figure out what your goals are and then select one to really drive towards it. There are uh, a number of different influencer strategies that work well for different things. One that's really great for getting the largest amount of impressions as possible. One that's great for driving engagement. One that's better for driving clicks or conversions. And so it's really important to nail down what your biggest metric is that you're trying to drive towards and optimize your campaign around that. Um, the second biggest thing that I would say is to um, figure out ways to make your events uh, you know, an exclusive experience for influencers. And I kind of touched on this one already as well, but when you make influencers feel special at your event or when you make them feel like it's something that they can only get there, they're going to be, they're going to feel like they are a part of the experience and, and want to talk about it more and share with their audience. And so I would find ways to, to make it an experience that's memorable for your influencers. Ooh, I love it. I love it. By the way, um, quick shout out. Uh, we have Dahlia joining us in the audience. Dahlia is from episode four. So everyone say so thank you to Dahlia for joining us today. Um, and yeah, just really want to make sure that you bring in uh, authentic influencers uh, as we were talking about. Rachel, what's your one tip that you have for everybody when it comes to uh, anything at all? <laughs> anything at all. Wow, that's broad. <laughs> So, well, for me, it's simple, you know, like just do it, experiment, stop reading about it, just try it out and see what works for you. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to hand over the megaphone to somebody else. I mean, long are gone the days where, you know, the association or the events like we are the voice of the industry, you know, it's no longer that you know, everybody can have a voice and empower them. I love it. I love it. Nick. All right, time to drop uh, your last knowledge bomb. Okay, I, don't know if I, can say, I know I can get it on a tweet or not. Um, so, uh, uh, I don't, <laughs> You're thinking don't, in terms of tweets all the time, Nick? <laughs> I, I'm yes, counting every actually, letter. Does it equal 140 characters? <laughs> 280 even. Uh, I'm always thinking about ways to be concise because it's a better way to resonate. But uh, I would say that... Um, it is important for you to uh, take on the role of influencer marketing, unlike what was done at the fire festival. That's a, that's a good example of uh, uh, what not to do. That was un uh, holistic. Um, the influencers took the money and copied and pasted. They were not partners of the event. Um, they suffered losses to their credibility as they should uh, and uh, in addition to it being an event planner fail on a lot of levels, it was an influencer marketing uh, fail. Uh, I would say that if you have the opportunity to engage, like this is a, I'll give you a, like you give me a business card as an ambassador of this conference, right? To take it from being an influencer and I did tweets for them. Uh, but I also was a position at the show as wayfinding, you know, so people could come to me and I would say, well, what are you, what are you doing? Well, you, you should go this way. If you like this kind of thing, a face that they recognized and, uh, took it from the digital to the real and made it more human. And I think that that's ultimately what we're talking about here is people like to do business with people. Uh, they like to, they trust people over brands and humanizing your, uh, your pitch and what you talk about as best you can by bringing people close to you and empowering them is what this is really uh, exciting, I guess. This is why it's exciting. Awesome. So we have one last question that we always ask all of our guests to close out the show. And it can be anything you want, even scuba gear. What are some of your favorite resources? And they can be anything. What, what is something that you go to for information or something that you use on a regular basis that you want to share? And we'll go in reverse this time. Let's start with Nick. Uh, I mean, my, my answer is to this kind of question is always the same, but it changes every single day. And that's 
I am a, a an addict of Google uh, alerts. I have so many Google alerts. If I want to know something about something, I will create a new or a series of Google alerts for that. And I'll create a folder that dumps all the information is as soon as something new on a, a topic that I want to know more about it hits, I want to be able to read a digest so I can pick the, uh, the best of it. Awesome. Rachel, how about yourself? Hmm. I'm lately, well, lately, since we launched the Snowball, obsessed with following up on the hashtag of the if, if influencer marketing and seeing what's going on there, not just in the event industry, but in general. So there's lots of resources and um, material found on um, many, many sites. And I added a couple of them on the resource list so that will be available after the show. So uh, people can check it out. Excellent. Melissa. Last answer of the day. Yeah, so a couple of really neat tools that, that we use. Um, one of them is to calculate influencer engagement. It's called Flanks. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'll, I'll put it in the, the resource doc, but it's essentially an engagement calculator where you plug in an influencer's Instagram handle and it spits out the average comments, average likes for their profile, as well as their overall um, average engagement. And that's been really helpful to see which influencers are absolutely crushing it right now to see who would be the best partners. Um, another uh, neat tool that we use is Luminu. And we actually just started working with them as well. And um, basically, they're a platform for um, influencer marketers to determine or to optimize paid campaigns. And so another part of influencer marketing is pairing it with paid amplification. And um, I can talk more about that in, in the chat later, um, but it, a cool feature about it is that it also tells you demographics for an influencer, which is really important. You can see um, the age of their audience, where they reside, um, male, female, um, those, those are some of the things that they, that, they, that they share. And one last thing is for um, live videos, because we've had influencers a number of times record live videos, is giving them a lavalier mic so that the audio is clear as well as a video or a phone stabilizer so that their live videos are super high quality, super crisp, um, and they just look better on, on Facebook or whatever platform it's for. Awesome. Awesome. And for those asking about, you know, what these resources are and how to spell them, um, all of this information will be condensed and put on uh, the helloendless.com slash blog. You can go there every week to see last week's resources. Um, we've got other ones that, you know, weren't mentioned on the show that our guests like to share as well. Um, so you can go there. You can also uh, find us on our new Facebook group, which is uh, – Busting at the scenes, it's blown up, which is fantastic. That's a great place to continue the conversation. Um, and that is facebook.com slash groups slash event icons dot show slash. So all of this information will be there. You can continue the conversation there. Um, I want to thank our guests. You know, it's, it's the end of the day. Um, thank you for being on the show today. This was fantastic information. I think this is something that everyone has heard about, but I think it's not often that we get to talk about it in, uh, you know, what this means for events. Um, so this is very exciting. Thank you very much for being on the show. Um, for everyone watching, uh, you know, Event Icons is recorded live each Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can watch behind the scenes on Facebook Live. Uh, we also release the show the following Tuesday on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast cast app is uh and of course you can always find us online at event uh icons.com that includes our show notes and links to the resources that are shared um but the best way to join us is live uh so sign up at event icons.com join the chat live here on zoom uh want to know what you think so go on twitter use the hashtag event icons uh and of course join the event icons facebook group um, we always want to know what icons you want to be on the show. Um, they might not be on the show till next year because we're pretty much booked through the end of the year, which is very exciting. Uh, we have some great shows in store for you. Um, thank you again for joining us, and we will see you next week here on Event Icons. 
Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.